Abba, I just pray you would speak to us today about one of the most formidable giants that many of us face in our lives. I pray that you would help us to see the end, help us to have faith in the end, help us to know that in Christ we are more than conquerors. Amen. Amen. 1 Samuel 27 takes an interesting turn for us as we've been going through this series, Conquering Giants. We've been looking at David. Even last week, we looked at David as, as really doing well, making great choices in his life. And it, it's because of a phrase that I introduced you to last week, and it was this idea that it said, David inquired of the Lord. David inquired of the Lord. He kept seeking God's wisdom, His advice, His, his direction, and, and the promise of God is that His Word will be a light unto our path. Even when there seems like there's no path, God gives us the ability to make a step at a time to conquer things in our lives. And so you would think that David had finally figured that out. Because you and I, once we figure it out, we never struggle again, right? <laughs> and so, but we're going to find in, in this passage that the, the whole timber of David's voice changes. The whole, the whole vibe of what's happening around him begins to shift again. And, and he begins to move towards a, really a, a feeling of depression and anxiety and hopelessness. Just prior to this, this passage in Samuel that we're about to read, here's some of the psalms that were beginning to come out of David's heart, out of his voice. Psalm 10.1, Why, O Lord, do you stand so far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13.1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is most famously referred to as the Psalm of the Cross because it so accurately reflects Christ's anguish on the cross as well. When David writes this in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groanings? I just want to be honest right now and just ask, how many of you in your life have struggled or know somebody close to you who has struggled with anxiety or depression. Okay, look around this room. Do you know the uh, United States of America has the highest rates of depression and anxiety of any other nation in the world? Which is kind of interesting in that we are the most affluent country in the world, have the most freedoms of any country in the world, and yet we struggle more with depression and anxiety than any other country in the world. So I wonder, if, I wonder if just having stuff impacts that or maybe it's irrelevant to what goes on in a deeper soul need in our lives. I want to talk a little bit today about overcoming and conquering the giant of depression that might be facing you or maybe facing somebody you love today. Because here's what begins to happen in David's life. He's finding himself again, just kind of he has two choices. He is so tired of being chased by Saul and hounded and hiding and maybe hungry and cold and tired and feeling abandoned and all these things start happening and he's not inquiring of God anymore and, and so he's kind of lifted two choices. Either he can um, give in to the pressure and compromise and, and, and kind of go his own way and hide or he can hold steadfast to what he knows is right and believe what God had promised. He had two choices in this passage, and we get these all the time in our lives. When we feel these things creeping back into our lives, we oftentimes have two choices. Compromise, go back to what seems familiar, or trust that God and what He says is true. How many of you have stood at that crossroads before? And so this is what David's beginning to find in his life. Listen, the peace that comes with compromise is temporary, but it does happen. It does work for a while. 
the peace that you find in your life by winning the battle that you're facing, by climbing the mountain that's in front of you, is substantial. I won't even say it lasts for a lifetime because many of us have more mountains to climb, but it is substantial. It does not leave, it is not life stealing for you. It gives you something to hold on to for the next battle you're facing. Go like this if you're all with me here, right? Good, even the camera's going up and down. Good, all right. So here's what we find of David. Notice this, verse 1 of chapter 27. But David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel. I will slip out of his hand. So David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, the son of Moak, king of Gath. I hope that sounds familiar because a few weeks ago, uh, Carrie was teaching on Gath and, and David already going back there. Gath, you know, Gath. This is where Goliath came from. Dude, why do you go back to the enemy's territory? Right? Why would you go back there? He is so tired of Saul chasing him. He goes, you know, maybe there's one place that Saul won't come after me, and that is if I'm in the land of the Philistines. Maybe if I just kind of go hang out near the enemy, Saul doesn't really want to go there. It's too much of a bother, and finally I can get some reprieve. Well, the last time David went there, he started drooling from the mouth and acting like a crazy man so they wouldn't kill him. But something, you know, this is stinking thinking in our heads, isn't it? You ever just like, get these twisted thoughts, if I just go do this, I, I know last time it didn't work, but at this time it's got to be different because it's been three days or it's been, you know, a year or whatever, right? And I, if I just try it this time. And so David, like in, in this crazy thinking, because he's just got so much anxiety and pressure built up around him, he thinks, I'm just going to go back to where Goliath was from. And so that's what he does. Now, we have a tendency... To return to a few of our favorite things, don't we? I mean, I don't want to just pick on David this morning. I mean, how many of you tend, when it really starts getting tough, when you start having a lot of fear in your life or depression in your life, how many of you go back to things that you know aren't healthy? Right? I mean, there's a season in my life when, when I started just feeling a lot of anxiety and security. Like, I would go back to sexual relationships or porn or something like that or high-risk behaviors and adrenaline things. So um, what else do you go back to? How transparent can we be this morning? I heard food. How many of us like comfort eating? Right? Uh, my wife chases me down every once in a while, pulls those Doritos from me and said, this is comfort food. And I'm, you know, but it's like a teddy bear. Why not? Right? It talks to me. Anyway, what else? Ex-girlfriends, how many of you have gone back to really toxic relationships before? Like, well, maybe he's different now, right? Maybe she's different now, right? Go back. Some of us will go back to the right things like prayer. What are some of the life-stealing things? I heard Xbox. How many of you go back to binging and just like you, you'll waste, you'll spend, I won't say waste, 48 hours straight or something on a, on a show, right? What else? Anger. Some of us go back to anger because anger gives us a sense of control. Some of us goes back to bad language, right? Isolation. Isolation. Good. Alcohol. How many of you have used a chemical in your life? That's an old familiar friend, right? Always promising you to feel better. So let's not, let's not dog David too much here. Let's learn from him. Okay? Something's going on. Pressure is mounting in his life. You hear the language of some of his psalms. God, I just, I feel abandoned. I feel left. I don't even know if you hear me anymore. And when we get to those points in our lives, we decide, well, what the heck? I guess I'll just do what I can do. And we go back and we start to anesthetize ourselves. He goes back to this town called Ziklag. Now, Ziklag is really interesting because Ziklag is right on the border of Judah, the kingdom of Israel, and uh, the Philistines. It's right on the border. As a matter of fact, what makes Ziklag really, really fascinating is that it had been conquered by Joshua. It was land given by God to the people of Israel, but then had been taken over again by the Philistines. So it's like this interesting little border town. The people that were there were living in a land that God had given them, but was controlled by the enemy. 
That's where David chooses to go to find reprieve in his life. Now, just put that in your pipe and smoke it for a minute. Living in the land God's given you, but it's being controlled by the enemy again. See, sometimes your mind is like that, isn't it? My mind is like that. See, with the cross of Christ, my mind has been renewed. It has been bought with a price, and yet I still give it over to the enemy again. Sometimes your home is like that. Do you know the, the Word tells us that, that when you come to Christ as the head of your home, you and your whole household can be saved, and yet sometimes like God redeems our home, and then we give it back to the enemy again. Choices we make in our lives with our finances or with relationships. It's like it's been God has set it free. He has given it to you. And then we let the enemy creep back into it. And we live right on the border there in our lives, don't we? Kind of a little bit of the, the enemy kind of picking on it, but he kind of ignores us. And, and a little bit of God, we know it's his, but God's like, hey, I could bless this if you let me. And we love to live on the border and things in our lives. I mean, we never settle like that. I mean, we never live in a point like in some area of our life that God is possessed and yet Satan, we've given him access again. And you know this because when you try to give it back to God, when you try to make it in harmony with him, that's when the enemy gets a little aggravated. And he goes, oh, no, 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 you gave me this back, remember? And all of a sudden you get flooded with that thing again. You get flooded with the desires again or flooded with the anger again or flooded with whatever again. This is those things that keep reentering our lives. Some of you, when it comes to anxiety and depression are this way. You kind of live under a black cloud, but then you start speaking truth. You start looking at the Word. You start finding hope again, and all of a sudden it's like it comes back worse than it was. It's because the enemy's not going to give up turf. He's not going to go, oh, you woke up, good for you. I'm sorry, I was just kind of hanging out here, right? He doesn't like that. He doesn't like things to, that were once God that has been turned over to him to give them back to the creator because he doesn't want you to be living in the image of God. He doesn't want you to be an image bearer in your life. Who are going to move? All right, so, verse, so this, is what, this is what's going on of David. So David's living on the border of this town. Jump down to verse 12. David lived in the Philistine territory for a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people lived in the land extending to Shur and Egypt. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or a woman alive, but took sheep and cattle and donkeys and camel and clothes. He returned to Achish, the enemy king. When Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? It's like when I'd ask my son, what did you do today? Oh, I just went and killed a bunch of people, you know. Like, Achish, not my son says that, I'm just saying. What did you do today, David? Oh, we went and raided this place or this place. David would say, well, we went against the Negev of Judah or against the Negev of Jeremel, against the Negev of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us this is what David did. See, the reality, David was living on the border. He was attacking the Philistines and other areas, coming back to King Achish and then lying to him, saying, well, I'm actually attacking Israel. And so he's playing both sides. You You understand what I'm saying? He's like totally living on the fence. Some of you do this with your friends right? You're hanging out with your friends and like you're just like, just like them. And I, you know, I, Seth and I were talking about this the other day. Like sometimes it's hard when we get introduced in, in other places. Like I, I don't want to admit I'm a pastor right away, not because I'm embarrassed of my faith, but because I don't want to get written off right away, right? But then there's times that like I kind of hide my faith when I'm with certain people um, because I, I just want to be like them, you know, and then I get around these people, and I want to be like them, and, and this is what David's doing. He's right on the border. He's just kind of playing this game. He's attacking the enemy, but then he's telling the enemy that he's attacking Israel, and Achish likes it because he likes David being around him, and notice what the enemy says, and such was his practice as long as he lived in the Philistine territory. As long as David was riding the fence, this is what he kept saying, Achish trusted David and said to himself, 
He has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. God forbid the devil would ever say that about you and I. That the enemy would ever have a place in your and my life to say, you know what? I think I got him now. He's actually just so obnoxious to the, his own people. He's going to serve me forever. Maybe you've been that point in your life. And then enters the power of the cross. Maybe in your struggle, looking at the giants in your life, that you feel like they've been winning, that maybe it's been overcoming you, maybe anxiety, depression, whatever that thing would be, and it just feels like it's winning, and the enemy's saying, yep, I got them now. They don't know who's in you. They don't know the truth of what has been bought in your life. They forget that they are not just fighting against you, but they are fighting against the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the life is in you. And so this is what begins to happen. And so David was going so far, he was getting so insane in his thoughts that he was like killing everybody just so nobody could get back to Achish. I mean, he had a whole trail of bodies behind him. He didn't, God hadn't been asking him to do that stuff. He was just going and going overboard. Just so, not so that God would win, but that David would be protected. It was all about self-protection. You with me here? It was all about David. It was all about David being safe. It was all about David compromising. It was all about David making a lie and covering up a lie and then covering up a lie with a lie and playing the fence. And he did this and he did this and did this. Why did this happen? Why was David acting like this? It all goes back to verse 1 of chapter 27. But David thought to himself. As a matter of fact, watch this in this first verse, verse here, how much I and me you get. But David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hands. This is what becomes a part of our lives when we get overtaken by the giant of anxiety or depression. It becomes all about us thinking inside we get alone in our head how many of you have ever had that thing it just goes around and around and around and around right this is kind of what the cause is depression and anxiety they force us to focus inwardly they focus to get isolated they they force us to get in the dark places of our lives and and we get depressed and we get and then listen god knows you and i are human okay he knows that we struggle with these things i'm not trying to make light of it i am trying to speak truth to you and i today i don't want to pretend these things don't exist in our lives because they're they're as real as addiction is in our lives there's real other struggles in our lives, but they are also conquerable like anything else in our lives if we walk in the truth of the Word. Here's what's really interesting about the first verse of chapter 27 there. David did not write another psalm for 16 months. How long was, in, was he in the land of the Philistines? 16 months. It's really hard to hear God's thoughts when the only thing you're thinking are your own. Ooh, that was tweetable. Some of you, yeah. <laughs> he had stepped out of God's provision and stepped into his own and hadn't written another psalm for 16 months. And you can see the debris around his life. So I want to finish with just real quick. Let me summarize this in two points because I, I don't want to go too long today. One is this. As you read chapter 27, there's a message here for our church. And that message is for the church as well. But many people in churches want to live in God's territory but not trouble the enemy too much. Maybe David and his men were thankful. They were like, oh, finally some reprieve from Saul. We just got to play this game a little bit, kind of ride the fence a little bit, and then nobody's going to be too mad at us. And, but listen, if you desert 
um, the enemy in one area of your life, if you, if you desert your calling in one area of your life, you actually open up your whole community. See, David playing the fence there meant he wasn't really fulfilling the role God had for him for 16 months, and he left a lot of other people vulnerable because of that. So when you're playing the fence, it's not just you that you're impacting, it's the people around you. And so, you know, and what's, you know, funny is I think people like, they're like, well, I'm in the battle, I'm fighting for, you know, God, and, and a lot of times I look at them like, you know, all they're doing is picking fights with the church, right? They're not really doing, going against the enemy, they're just like going after the church, and, and I see this in people all the time. Like they start, ah, this is, I don't like this, and that preaching, and that person, and that, you know, I, you allow smoking? Oh, my God. And, you know, they just, you know, and they're just picking fights with other churches or other people in the church, and that's, that's not doing battle with the enemy, people. That's shooting your own team, right? And so what David needed to do was get back into what God had called him to do and, and stop playing around in the fence there so much. This church is called to reach the wanderer. This church is called to reach the margins. That's what we're about. And listen, you're in a battle whether you like it or not. When you sign up for the kingdom of God, you've signed up for an army. So, I mean, you might as well fight, right? And not just kind of hang out and hide. Okay, but the second point is this. And more critical to our message today. Depression... And anxiety are real giants in people's lives. Now, depression can come in a number of different ways. Depression can come circumstantially. Have you ever just felt the pile-up effect in your life? Or anxiety can come circumstantially. Have you ever just kind of had one thing after another after another? You just kind of like want to toss, throw in the towel? Okay? That, that's possible in your life, and that's much like what's happening to David here. He just can't get away from this relentless pressure in his life, and, he, and he's finding himself depressed. Now, depression can also come chemically. We can have brain imbalances that, that require medication. Just like your leg can be broken, sometimes our mind can get broken. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, except that something's broken and needs fixed. Pain is a signal in your body something's wrong. You get me? That means you got to find a cure, all right? You can't take somebody who's chemically depressed and then try to reason with them out of it. Just like if somebody has diabetes in their life, you can't say, well, just think your way out of it, right? It doesn't work. You can give a diagnosis, but there's still got to be a treatment in our lives, okay? So there's circumstantial depression, there's chemical depression and there can be spiritual depression. You are in a war and the enemy loves to go after some people and bring anxiety into their sleep or depression into their sleep, oppression into their sleep. And so there's three really kind of general things. I'm not trying to turn this into a mental health conference here, but here, here's the reality. Regardless of the source of your depression, the ultimate cure for your depression is the cross. All right? So the Bible tells us, you know, if we confess our sin or our brokenness to God, He is faithful to cleanse us and heal us of all unrighteousness. But He also says in James, confess your brokenness one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. We need the power of God in our lives to keep us afloat in anxiety and depression, and we need the brothers and sisterhood of each other to pray for us and come alongside of us in those things and not just give us these cute little spiritual band-aids. Not just, hey, brother, if you'll just sing Hakuna Matata all day long, you're going to be just fine, right? That's not the way it works. we got to walk with people through whatever stuff they're going through because people need to walk with us when we get into ours. And so I want to encourage you that if you know somebody who's struggling with anxiety or depression, to first love them as they are and not as they should be because none of us is as we should be. If you're struggling with anxiety or depression... Here is what I can tell you is true. Jesus said, surely, and even if your name's not Shirley, this works. 
Surely I am with you, even until the very end. He will never leave you or forsake you. If you have no other thread to hold on to but that one, His word is true. His word that tells you no in all things. All things. Is anxiety and depression a thing? Is it one of those all things? Then no, in all things we are more than conquerors in Christ. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither any power, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is the truth you can hold on to. There is nothing. If you're Depression is caused by anxiety or caused by demons or caused by circumstances. There is nothing that can stand in the way of you being loved because of Jesus Christ. Because His power broke that in your life. Let's stand. God, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for the just amazing things You've already been doing today in our midst. And uh, we receive the truth. We choose not to rely on our feelings, but to hold on to the truth of your word that you are with us to the very end. And whether we are crawling or limping or running, you are right there with us. So may you walk in the reality of the word of God this week. May you be able to communicate that reality to those you love. And may you always give permission to people who are climbing that mountain to keep climbing. May you give them hope that there is victory. And may you give them unconditional love, whether they slip and slide or work their way up. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to a message from the Sanctuary Church. For more information and media, go to our website at thesanctuarywestside.org or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube.